Good morning, it's day six. The black blogger salutes the black masters, the black masters, the black authors, the historic black authors. For the next two days, I'm going to do two excerpts from two of Richard Wright's books. Today, I'm going to start with Native Son, probably Richard's most noted work with an introduction by Arnold Rappers, Rapp Persand, Native Son, The Black Blogger. Dedication to my mother who, when I was a child at her knee, taught me to revere the fanciful and the imaginative. Epigraph, even today is my complaint rebellious, my stroke is heavier than my groaning Job. Introduction. The sound of the alarm that opens Native Song was Richard, Wright, Richard Wright's urgent call in 1940 to America to awaken from its self-induced slumber about the reality of race relations in the nation. As proud, rich, and powerful as America was, Richard insisted the nation was facing a grave danger, one that would ultimately destroy the United States if its dimensions and devious complexities were not recognized. Native Son was intended to be America's guide in confronting this danger. Richard Wright believed that few Americans, black or white, were prepared to face squarely and honestly the most profound consequences of more than two centuries of enslavement and segregation of blacks in North America. The, dehuman, the dehumanization of African Americans during slavery had been followed in the long aftermath of the Civil War by the often brutal repression in the South and by conditions of life in many respects equally severe and anomaly integrated North. Nevertheless, Richard White Wright knew blacks and whites alike continued to cling to a range of fantasies about the true nature of the relationship between the races, even as the nation lurched inexorably towards a possible collapse over the fundamental question of justice for the despised African-American minority. Among blacks, the pattern of abuse and exploitation had created ways of life marked by patterns of duplicity, including self-deception, as well as far more forbidding and lethal. Slavery and neo-slavery had led not simply to the development of a psychologic, psychology of tim timidity tim uh, and, passiv and passivity and even cowardice among the African-American masses. Richard suggests the native son, but also to an ominous emergent element of which Bigger Thomas, the central character of the novel, is a reliable, if particularly forbid, for, forbidding, example. Although this new element was itself susceptible to fantasy and self-deception, which set its members apart from other blacks, was the depth of their estrangement from both black and white culture. Their hatred of both groups and their sometimes unconscious but powerful identification of violence against other human beings as the most appropriate response to the disastrous conditions of their lives. Within the confines of the black world, this violence was easily directed at fellow blacks, but increasingly Richard warned his readers this violence would be aimed at whites. Richard fully understood that his message was radical to the core, and that his novel Native Son was not was was like no other book in the history of African American literature. In 1937, his landmark essay, 
blueprint for Negro writing. He had characterized African American literature to that time as fundamentally lacking in forthrightness and independence. Generally speaking, he had written reprovingly Negro writing in the past has been confined to humble novels, poems and plays, prim and decorous ambassadors who went a begging to white America dressed in the knee pants of civility. For the most part, these artistic ambassadors were received as though they were French poodles who do clever tricks. To some extent, Richard Wright certainly had overstated the case for the inadequacy of past black writers. At least since the publication of David Walker's vitriolic appeal in 1829, some had vigorously protested against racism and warned white Americans about its dire consequences. Indeed, the inevitability, the inevitability of violence as a response to the African-American condition had been the subject of literary works not only by blacks but also by whites, such as George Washington Cable in the 19th century and in Wright's own time, William Faulkner. For example, in his short story, The Coming of John and the Souls of Black Folks, 1903, and in his novel, The Dark Princess, in 1928, W.E.B. Du Bois, probably the leading African-American intellectual and pulmonist of his day, had depicted young black heroes enraged by racism and literally striking whites who had offended them. Blacks had hailed Claude McGee's 1919 sonnet, If We Must Die, as a call to militant self-defense against marauding whites. Gene Toomer's modern landmark Kane in 1923, which included one sketch in which a black man coolly kills a white man who draws a knife on him. However, such episodes were few and far between, and, was, and with rare exception, virtually all of these black writers had placed at the center of their episodes of violence a protagonist of intelligence and sensitivity driven to an uncharacteristic act a man of feeling from the black leadership class forced to act in ways otherwise beneath him. Not so with Richard White and Native Son. Bigger Thomas is decidedly of the poorest class, with no pretense to sophisticated education, to anything more than read a rudimentary reading or to two ideals. Bigger is occasionally cunning, but there is little that is subtle about his intelligence or refined about Bigger's emotions. Knowing almost nothing about books or serious magazines, intellectually he is a creature of the movie house where he is an easy prey to fantasies concocted by Hollywood for the gullible. Bigger despises religion, appeals to religious faith, either bore or enrage him and strange from his family. He is, he is remote even from his mother. He has apparently grown up without his father who has never mentioned a native son. Richard sets the tone for the depiction of Bigger Thomas in the first scene of the novel when he pits him physically against a rat that terrorizes the family. Bigger Thomas ruins this battle but not without a loss of dignity from which he barely recovers by the end of the book. Although black literature has witnessed cameo appearances by renegade blacks, examples of the bad nigger as Sterling A. Brown called one of his main literary stereotypes of African-American characters, no one quite like Bigger Thomas had ever been seen before the publication of Native Song. Nevertheless, one can locate at least some of the key elements of biggest characterization in a broader literary tradition. Unmistakably behind Native Son, although in no way distracting from Richard's personal achievement in creating the novel, is the tradition of naturalism, especially urban naturalism, 
in American writing as epitomized before Richard by novelists such as Frank Nye, Stephen Crane, Jack London, Theodore Dresda, and James T. Farrell. To such writers, the city in the late teenth century, late 19th and, 20, and the early 20th century in America could be an alluring place, but it also was for persons without brains or money or simply good luck, a crucible in which the superficial elements of personality and civilization were burnt away to reveal the animal underneath. As Richard grew up in the South under the harsh conditions he would describe in this autobiography published in 1945, Black Boy, Black Boy, and began to read fiction he took readily to urban naturalism. For him, the road to native sun has started with his first exposure to the major naturalists and realists. All my life had shaped me for the realism, the naturalism of the modern novel, he declared, and black boy, and I could not read enough of them. Richard was born in Mississippi in 1908, the first of two sons of a sharecropper who deserted his family when Richard was five or six. Soon after, his mother suffered paralactic strokes that left her dependent on her own mother, a default religious fundamentalist and stern disciplinarian who apparently tried to crush Richard's childhood interest in the world of imagination. While his mother sank in, in, in his eyes into the embodiment of passivity and victimization, he found it almost impossible to forge a warm tie with other human beings. For a while, Richard and his brother lived in an orphanage. Later, he would recall his childhood at the time of hunger for food, but also for affection, understanding, and education. A good student, he never finished high school. His jobs in the South were marked by harassment by whites and by his own disdain for what segregation and racism has done to distort the humanity of his fellow blacks as he saw it. So in 1927, Richard flew the South for Chicago. If Richard took quickly to naturalism, two other intellectual forces modified his understanding of its ideals and helped to shape Native song. The first was communism or dialectic materialism. The second was Richard's almost instinctive sympathy for and identification identification with the germ of the modern philosophy called existentialism, a sympathy and an, and an identification that predated his years of residence in Paris following his immigration in 1947 and his friendships there with some of the most famous existentialist philosophers and artists. Communism and existentialism exist in certain ways in tension with naturalism. The former defines identity mainly through the instrument of economic determinism, economic, social, political, and historical factors above all determine consciousness. The latter existentialism shares with naturalism a gloomy sense of fundamental human relations, but emphasizes the power of the will in creating identity. In his rise to intellectual maturity as represented by Native Sung, Richard took upon himself the daunting task of reconciling sometimes conflicting elements of these intellectual traditions in order to represent reality as he understood it. After all, he undertook to achieve as an artist working in the form of a novel, a sense of a, a synthesis he would have found virtually impossible as a philosopher or an ideologue. Between 1933 and 1940, or during the first major stage of his literary career, communism was clearly the major intellectual and political force of Richard Wright's life. In Chicago, he seemed headed for a career in the post office, but also determined to become a writer. In that city, the setting of Native Sung, he found a circle of like-minded young men and women winning 
1933, he joined the recently formed local branch of the John Reed Club, a nationwide organization founded by the party precisely to attract writers and artists to its rank. If, as Wright later claimed, he learned from the iconoclastic journalist H.L. Mekin how one could use words as weapons, the Communist Party offered him and other writers in the midst of the Great Depression a sense of ideological and political purpose and consistency as well as international connections. As a creative writer, Richard started out as a poet singing, sometimes in fashion that showed the influence of Walt Whitman, the revolutionary potential of the masses, including the black masses. When he turned to fiction, however, in the novel Lord Today, which was published after he died, the radical socialist fervor that marked his poetry was severely modified by a different version, vision, that of a particularly bleak urban naturalist mixed somewhat uneasily with the elements of modernist fictional technique borrowed from various sources, including James Joyce, James's Joyce Ulysses. Lord, today tells the story of one day in the life of a black postal worker and three of his closest friends, also male black postal employees, in Chicago's South Side, dominating the lives and of these men is a chronic desire for sensual gratification, mainly in the food form of food, alcohol, and sex. If in a somewhat heavy-handed way, Richard Wright seeks to document a typical day in their lives, the better to show the extent to which they are ignorant of any moral, intellectual, aesthetic, or religious idea or ideal worthy of the name. The action of the novel, which takes place on Lincoln's birthday, is juxtaposed against the solemn tribute to Abraham Lincoln that casts the further pall over the aimless lives of these men. Lord Today was rejected by at least a half a dozen American publishers. When Richard's first book, Uncle Tom's Children, finally appeared and comprised four stories, a novelette, a revised edition in 1940, added a fifth story, Bright and Morning Star. In these tales, all set in the South, Richard showed his skill in writing not only communist-style narratives, but also far less dictatic fictions. The pieces firing cloud and bright and morning stars, stories about radical political activity that feature a strong endorsement of the revolutionary potential of the masses. They both also touch on the uneasy interplay between communism and the elements of black cultural naturalism, nationalism, excuse me. The other stories, Big Boy Leaves Home and Long Black Song Down by the Riverside are far less didactic. Di di All of the five stories implicitly protest against racism and segregation, but the second group offers no program that would show the way out of the morass of racial discrimination. By the time Uncle Tom's children appeared in 1938, Richard was already questioning the authority of the Communist Party where it mattered most to him, that is, where its autonomy as an artist was concerned. Clearly for him, the revolutionary confidence of Bright and Morning Star and the prize-winning Fire and cloud which ends with blacks and whites marching together in the South obscured the truth about the two major races in America. His non communist stories, too, with their country southern settings and their emphasis on youth, womanhood, and or, or his struggle with the elements, later seemed to Richard curiously curtailed expositions, indeed almost local color. Most disturbing to Richard, even as he enjoyed the accolades that came to him as a result of Uncle Tom's children, was the quality of lyric idealism that suffused the entire collection and allowed the final effect of the book to be mainly, at least as Richard saw it, in his uncompromising way, a good cry. 
Richard understood that neither his employment of a radical socialist aesthetic, which preferred simple stories of revolutionary activity, nor his more subjective attempts to depict and comment on race relations in the South had succeeded in doing what he established as a major goal of his writing. The exposure of the starkest realities of American life where race was concerned. Richard Wright knew that much of his life was quite beyond hope that racism and segregation were not forces to be eradicated easily by programs, much less by slogans, and that even the most graphic evocations of suffering would not be enough to move readers to see racism for what it was. As he himself put it, Richard discovered that in Uncle Tom's children, he had written a book which even bankers' daughters could read and feel good about. He then swore that the one that followed would be different. He would make sure that no one would weep over it and that it would be so hard and deep that they would have to face it without the consolation of tears. The next book was Native Song. As Wright recalled when he started to write the story of Bigger Thomas, the basic story flowed almost without an effort. In a real sense, he had been studying Bigger Thomas all of his life. Wright's essential Bigger Thomas was not so much a particular character caught in a specific episode of criminal activity as a crime waiting to happen. All of the elements to create Bigger's mentality were historically in place in America, stocked by the criminal racial situation that was America. I had spent years learning about Bigger and what had made him and what he meant, so when the time came to writing, what had made him and what he meant constituted my plot. Translating this idea into a narrative almost came easily. The plot fell out, fell out so to speak. In truth, Wright heavily revised the manuscript as he worked, and, and the dramatic opening scene featuring Bigger in his rat was a late addition. But almost everything else took shape swiftly in response to a mighty effort by Wright to complete his novel. At the center of Native Song is Bigger's consciousness. Where, where had Bigger come from? It, in his essay, How Bigger Was Born, also published in 1940, Richard conceded that as with many, with any sincere artist, his work of art has a life of its own. There are meanings in my books of which I, w I was not aware until they literally spilled out upon the paper. On the other hand, he was well aware from the start of the fundamental nature of his central character who epitomized for right the most radical effect of racism on the black psyche. He recalled having met at least five specific biggers in his youth. The first had been an ugly brutish bully who, impervious to the notions of justice or fair play, had intimidated and abused Richard Wright and, and other black boys. The remaining prototypes of bigger, however, distinguished themselves by the way in which their antisocial behavior was linked to their hatred of whites. That behavior moved to a spectrum from a devious opposition to white power to an open defiance of even its most intimidating shabobothlets. Surviving miraculously, in some cases, the most aggressive biggers could not be cowed by threats of violence or by the law. Bigger, however, was not an exclusively black phenomenon. Richard himself declared that the turning point for him in his understanding of social reality, the pivot of my life, was his discovery of the ubiqu ubiquitousness of bigger. There are literally millions of him everywhere. White biggers abound in response to the same fundamental environment that helps sponsor in situations that involve blacks, the secondary conditions that produce black beggars. These conditions reflected the failures of modern civilization, the depth of genuine spiritual values and tradition, the harshness of economic greed and 
exploitation, the avarance for glittering material goods that in a culture of consumerism ultimately possess the possessor. White beggars too were cut off from the from nurturing communal values and as emotionally ravaged by a gnawing sense of alienation as the black beggars who had impressed themselves on Wright's imagination. These men, Wright, never seemed to have conceived of bigger in female terms, saw in a garnished light the failure of their society as cultural and political ideals and promises and refused to accept the compromise that this most individuals made for simple, simple self-preservation. The existence of bigger across racial lines enabled both Richard enabled Richard both to come to terms with the limitation of Black American culture, of which he would write almost abusive force and with with, with abusive force in his autobiography Black Boy, and to set the problems of facing Blacks alongside those facing whites and thus allow a reciprocity, uh, reciprocity of interest and influence that he had never guessed at in his youth. Nevertheless, the task for representing bigger in fiction remained dawning. Unlike the dogmatic communist ideology, Richard was in the process of repudiating the social and political criticism implicit in these marginal lives was by definition incoherent. Their actions had simply made impressions upon my sensibilities that I lived from day to day, Richard recalled. Impressions which crystallized and co co uh, coagulated within the clusters and configurations of mem memory, attitude, moods, and ideas and these subjective states in turn were automatically stored away somewhere in me. I was not even aware of the process, but excited over the book which I had set myself to write under the stress of emotion, these things came surging up, tangled fuse knotted, entertaining me by the sheer variety and potency of their meaning and their suggest suggestiveness. Around the centrality of bigger, Richard Wright said a cast of characters meant to, meant to stand for the principal players on the American stage where race is concerned. One group represented the black world, bigger and bigger's family and friends, but also peripheral figures ready to support or betray him. Capitalism appears in the person of Mr. Dalton, the capitalist fair hair, handmaiden, liberal, liberalism, and, and the person of the blind Mrs. Dalton and the warm but giddy figure of Murray, communism, cold and analytical, but fallible in the person of Max, genial but susceptible, susceptible in the figure of Jane, Jan Erlon, whose naivete and paternalism helped to precipitate the tragedy Religion and the hapless, incomp incompetent black preacher scorned by bigger, and the overt racism and reaction as represented best perhaps by the state's attorney. The city of Chicago too looms as a character in itself, like bigger much of the time, brooding, dark, and violent. Nature also participates, especially in the form of the snowfall that ultimately, importantly, gives his color traps and delivers bigger to his fate. Setting in motion the tragedy is relatively is a relative is the relatively simple act of bringing bigger with his alienations and hostilities into contact with hypocrisy and culpable ignorance of the Dalton world. Richard Wright also fully un understood fully as Faulkner showed he himself understood in his novels, Light in August and Absalon, Absalon, both published in the 1930s, that there could be no truly probing discussion of the subject of race in America without the extended reference to questions about of sexuality and miscegenation. 
after his arrest, Bigger Thomas is falsely accused of the rape of Mary Dalton, a crime obviously worse than murder in the minds of some whites. However, Wright took pains to show that the rape of Mary Dalton was indeed a possibility with Bigger and material excavated by the Book of the Month Club, but restored in this edition of the novel. Booker responds sexually to a newsreel that shows Mary and other apparently wealthy, carefree young white women caravanning on a beach in Florida. In a scene that, it, that particularly appalled the club, Bigger and his friend masturbate soon after in the movie house. Bigger essentially rapes his girlfriend, Bessie, before killing her. Wright makes it clear that Bigger's harsh upbringing has left his sexuality contaminated with feelings of aggression and violence toward women, black and white. Because of the sexuality of the white woman is flaunted in movies and magazines, but absolutely forbidden to black men. Bigger and men like him sometimes develop a potentially murderous fixation on these women. Rape may then acquire the illusion of being a political act but the underlying threat to women is real and deadly. Much of the composition of the novel came almost spontaneously, especially after Bigger had committed his crimes because the relationship of the white police to the black male was a story absolutely familiar to write and indeed to the black community as a whole. A Winfield also came to book to, to Richard Wright in 1938 when a case similar in crucial respects to Bigger's native son, son broke in Chicago. That month, Robert Nixon, a young black man, along with an accomplice, was arrested and charged with the murder of a white woman beat to death with a brick in her apartment in the course of a robbery. Securing virtually all the newspaper clippings about the Nixon case, Richard used many of his details in the novel. Those details included copious examples of raw white racism, especially in depicting the black defendant as hardly more than a animate, an animal. Confessing to an earlier murder of a woman with a brick, Robert Nixon was also implicated in a similar murder in Los Angeles of a woman and her young daughter. Robert was executed in August of 1939. Although, Nixon, although the Nixon trial material helped Wright, he was still left with the supreme problem of creating a fictional narrative with so brutalized and limited a character at its core. In a way, this was the same dilemma that reached all of the major naturalist writers, for example, Stephen Crane and Maggie, a girl of the streets of Frank Norris and Matigue, but Wright's difficulties were more, more severe because it is hard to think of a central character in all of literature who is less likable than Bigger Thomas. With other blacks, Bigger is bullying, surly, treacherous, and cowardly. With whites, understandably, to be sure, he was wary and deceitful. How could Wright expect such a character to hold his novel together and to hold his reader's interest? Rather than dismiss Bigger's inner life as unworthy of artistic attention or social or political attention, Wright set out not only not simply to recreate its principal feature, but to allow these features to prescribe the form of his novel. He worked hard to evoke and dramatize the sordid and unstable nature of his main character's inner, inner life, which masked the sordidness and instability imposed by bigger by white racism and deep effects of that racism on black culture. In the tripod division of Native Son, Fear, Flight, and Fate is seen Wright's instinctive grasp of the elemental starkness of Bigger's life. From Wright's sense of pulsing instability of Bigger's thoughts and emotions, now flammed with rage and desire, now chilling with brackish and 
uh, down chilling in brackets with despair and, uh, and impotence. He fashioned the peculiar prose rhythms that dominate the book and make us feel as readers that we are sharing in biggest moods and thoughts. Native Song is a story that is at one le level a seedy melodrama from the police blotter and at the same time a illuminating drama of an individual consciousness and the challenges, the traditional definitions of character. Although one, one least critic has written eloquently about the tragic dimensions of Bigger Thomas to many other critics, the most that probably can be said in this respect is that at the end of his ordeal, Bigger processes glimmerings of the ideals that might have allowed him to be seen as a tragic hero. There are many critics of the novel who find unconvincing even a modicum of change in Bigger at the end of the book. To Richard Wright, it was an absolute necessity that Bigger should learn from his ordeal. The problem was to how to find the appropriate degree of redemption or growth for a character who had been established as such a low point on the scale of humanity. Perhaps the change is unconvincing at some assert, but it is hardly excessive. Richard resisted the promptings of propaganda for communism or for the vaunted American way of life or on behalf of the black middle class sensitivity and of the liberal sentiment which could have easily led him to patronize Bigger and transform him by the end of the novel into what Bigger could never be, a sensitive, normal human being. Tough-minded to the end, Richard refused to compromise his, his commitment to the truth as he saw it. Virtually from the day of its publication, the artistry of Native Song has been questioned and found warning, citing a category of writing identified by R.P. Blackmore. One scholar critic called the novel The Words of Black Mirrors, one of those books in which everything is undertaken with the seriousness except the writing. This is a common accusation against naturalist writers as well as the literature of social protests in general. Dreiser, for one, comes quickly to mind. Certainly, Richard Wright took chances in the course of writing this novel. At one point, for example, in defiance of artistic common sense, he crowds in the biggest cell almost every principal character in this story. Three members of Bigger's family, three of his friends, his lawyer Max, his prosecutor, the Daltons, Jane Orlani, and a minister. Wright concedes the improbability of such a scene, but gave us as his reason for keeping it the fact that I wanted those people in that cell to elicit a certain important emotional response from Bigger. What I wanted was, what I wanted that scene to say to the reader was more important than its surface reality of implausibility. The long speeches and summation by the state's attorney and the defense lawyer also seemed to some readers as an uncharacteristic as an uncharacteristic challenge <clears throat> challenge to the powers of attention and to underscore rights dialectic purposes in native song. Richard knew the risk, but he hoped that his readers would would pay attention to the arguments that they that they were both pieces of of ver, ver, <clears throat> vermillicent multitude that replicated the activity of a murder trial and at the same time indispensable extended statements of rival intellectual positions on the matter of race in America. In a way, these lectures prove Wright's artistic power since Native Sun is already unforgettable long before they are delivered. And these speeches do not detract from the power of the last scene, especially the last page of the novel. 
with some justification. Dorothy Canfield Fisher, who in her introduction to the first edition of Native Son compared the novel to Dasha Heskey's revelation of human misery and wrongdoing, declared that there is no one single effect in Dostoevsky finer than this final page in which Bigger is born at last into humanity and makes his first simple Norman, normal human response to a fellow man. Set to be published in 1939 by Harper's, which brought out Uncle Tom's Children in 1938, Native Song was selected by the influential Book of the Month Club and issued as a main selection in 1940 after Wright made revisions demanded by the club. That year it sold some quarter million copies, no doubt mainly to the members of the club. However, sales of the book fell off sharply, according to at least one report, once prospective buyers understood that Native Son was not an entertaining detective story, as some had supposed, but a serious, even harrowing text. The reviews, generally favorable, certainly remarked on the violence and gloom of the novel. Blacks were on a whole pleased by Richard's success, although some had doubts about the wisdom of offering Bigger Thomas as an example of African-American character to the white world. Alan Locke, a highly respected commentator on Black American art and culture, noted that it had taken some artistic courage and integrity of the first order for Wright to have ignored both the squeamishness of the Negro minority and the deprecating base bias of the prejudiced majority. Native Song made Richard easily the most respected black writer in America and the most prosperous by far. In 1941, a stage production of the novel directed by Orson Welles, only, Orson Welles only enhanced Richard's fame. A motion picture of the novel photographed mainly in Argentina with Wright himself cast as Bigger Thomas was finished in 1950, however, it enjoyed little success, especially after censors in the United States ordered deep cuts. In 1945, his autobiography, Black Boy, was also a bestseller, but Native Son remained the cornerstone of Richard's success. In 1948, his reputation suffered undoubtedly from the severe criticism of James Baldwin, who essentially launched his own career that year with an essays, Everybody's Protest Novel, which dismissed Native Song as a, mere, as a piece of mere protest fiction, reductive of human character and thus fatally limited as art. In 1952, the appearance of Richard of Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man with his dazzling modernistic techniques, his lyricism, humor, and final optimism about America also tended to make Native songs seem crude in comparison. In the 1960s, however, with the dawning of the Black Power Movement, after the most bloody stage of the civil rights struggle and the shocking upsurge in violent crime in the cities, especially among young Blacks, Richard Wright's novel increasingly seemed strikingly accurate and indeed prophetic. Later in the 1980s, Richard Wright's reputation suffered again, this time under the scrutiny of feminist literary criticism, which could hardly miss the fact that with few exceptions, the women of his fiction is, fun is fundamentally hostile. The world of, of his fiction is fundamentally hostile to women, especially black women. Nevertheless, Richard Wright seems certain to enjoy, continue to enjoy a lasting place of high honor in the African-American and American literary traditions and to be recognized as an author of world-class dimensions. While his overall reputation rests on a number of texts in different genres, including autobiography, essay, and travel writing, Native Song remains Richard Wright's greatest achievement. 
1963, three years after Richard's sudden death in a Paris hospital. The acclaimed cultural historian Irvin Howe summed it up, perhaps for all time, the epochal, the epochal significance of a novel, even as he criticized several aspects, several of its aspects. The day Native Son appeared, American culture was changed forever. Howe declared it made impossible a repetition of the old lies and brought in brought out into the open as no one had ever before the hatred, fear, and violence that have crippled and may yet destroy our culture. And this introduction is was written by Ronald Arnold Raps, Rappensad from Princeton University. An alarm clock clanged in a dark and silent room. A bed sprang creaked. A woman's voice sang out impatiently. Bigger, shut that thing off. A surly grunt above the teeny ring of metal. Naked feet swished dryly across the planks and the wooden floor, and the clang ceased abruptly. Turn on the light, Bigger. All right, came a sleepy mumble. Light flooded the room and revealed a black boy standing in a narrow space between two on beds, rubbing his eyes with the back of his hands. From bed to his right, the woman spoke again. Buddy, get up from there. I got a big washing on my hands today, and I want you all out of here. Another black boy rose from the bed and stood up. The woman also rose and stood in her nightgown. Turn your head so I can dress, she said. The two boys averted their eyes and gazed into a far corner of the room. The woman rushed out of her nightgown and put on a pair of step step ins. She turned on, she turned to the bed from which she had risen and called, "Vera, get up from there." "What time is it, Ma?" asked the ruffled adolescent voice from beneath a quilt. "Get up from there," I say. "Okay, Ma." A brown-skinned girl and a cotton gown got up and stretched her arms above her head and yawned. Sleepily, she sat on a chair and fumbled with her stockings. The two boys kept their faces averted while the mother and sister put on enough clothes to keep them from feeling ashamed, and the mother and sister did the same while the boys dressed. Abruptly, they all paused, holding their clothes in their hands. Their attentions caught by a light tapping in a thinly plastered in the thinly plastered walls of the room. They forgot their conspiracy against shame, and their eyes strayed appreciably over the floor. There he is again, Booger, Bigger, the woman screamed in the tiny one room apartment, galvanized into a violent action. A cheer toppled as the woman, half dressed in it, in her stocking feet, scrambled breathlessly above the, upon the bed. Her two sons, barefoot and, and stood tense and motionless, their eyes searching, searching anxiously under the chair and under the bed. The girl ran into the corner, half stooped, and gathered the hem of her slip into both of her hands and held it tightly over her knees. Oh, oh, she, she wailed. There he goes. The woman pointed a shaking, the woman pointed a shaking finger. Her eyes were round with fascinated horror. Where? I don't see him. Bigger, he's behind the trunk, the girl whimpered. Vera, Vera, the woman screamed, get out, get up here on the bed. Don't let that thing bite you. Frantically, Vera climbed upon the bed and the woman caught hold of her with her arms entwined around each other. The black mother and the brown daughter gazed open mouthed at the trunk in the corner. Biggest looked round the room wildly and darted to a curtain and swept it aside and grabbed two heavy iron skillets from a wall above of the gas stove. He swirled and called softly to his brother, his eyes glued to the trunk. The trunk, buddy? Yeah, here, take this skillet, okay? Now get over by the door, okay? Buddy crouched by the door and held his iron skillet in its hands, his arm flexed and poised. Save for a quick, deep breathing of the four people, the room was quiet. Bigger crept on his tiptoe toward the trunk with the skillet clutched stiffly in his hand, his 
eyes dancing and watching every movement of the wooden floor in front of him. He paused and without an, without moving an eye or muscle called, Buddy, huh? Put that box in front of that hole so he can't get out. Okay, well, Buddy ran to a wooden box and shoved it quickly in front of a gaping hole in the molding and then backed away to the door, holding the skillet ready. Bigger eased to the trunk and peered into it cautiously. He saw nothing. Carefully, he stuck his bare foot and pushed the trunk a few inches. There it is. There he is, the mother screamed again. A huge black rat squealed and leaped at Bigger's trouser leg and snagged him in his snagged it in his teeth, hanging on. God damn! Bigger whispered fiercely, whirling and kicking out his leg with all the strength of his body. The force of his movement shook the rat loose and it sailed through the air and struck a wall. Instantly it rolled over and leaped again. Bigger dodged and the rat, rat landed against the table leg with clenched teeth. Bigger held the skillet. He was afraid to hurl it, fearing that he might miss. The rat squealed and turned and ran in a narrow circle, looking for a place to hide. It leaped again past Bigger, scared on a dry, rasping feet to one side of the box and then to the other, searching for a hole. Then it turned and reared upon its hind legs. Hit him, Bigger, Buddy shouted. Kill him, that woman, the woman screamed. That, rally, that rat's belly pulsed with fear. Bigger advanced a step and the rat emitted a long, thin song of defiance, its black beady eyes glistering, its tiny forehead pawing the air restlessly. Booger swung the skillet. It skidded over the floor, missing the rat, and clattered to a stop against the wall. God damn! The rat leaped. Bigger sprang to one side. The rat stopped under a chair and let out a furious shriek. Bigger moved slowly backwards towards the door. Give me that skillet, buddy, he asked quietly, not taking his eyes from the rat. Buddy extended his hands. Bigger caught the skillet, lifted it high in the air. The rat scuttled across the floor and stopped once again at the box and searched quickly for a hole. Then it reared once more and bared its long yellow fangs piping shrilly, belly quivering. Bigger aimed and let the skillet fly with a heavy grunt. There was a shattering of wood as the box caved in. The woman screamed and hid her face in its in her hands. Bigger tiptoed forward and peered. I got him, he mumbled. He muttered, his clenched teeth bared in a smile. By God, I got him. He kicked the splintered box out the way, and the flat box, black body of the rat laid exposed his two long yellow tusks showing distinctively. Bigger took a shoe and pounded the rat's head, crushing it, cursing hysterically. You son of a bitch! The woman on the bed shrank to her knees and buried her face in the quilts and sobbed. Lord, Lord, have mercy. Oh, Mama, Vera whimpered, and bending to her. Don't cry, it's dead now. The two brothers stood over the dead rat and spoke in tones of awed admiration. Jeez, a big bastard. That son of a bitch could cut your throat. He's over a foot long. How in the hell do they get that big? eating garbage and anything else they can get. Look, Bigger, there's a three-inch rip, three rip in your pants leg. Yeah, he was after me, all right. Please, Bigger, take him out. Vera Bay. Oh, don't be so scary, buddy, said. The women on the bed continued to sob. Bigger took a piece of newspaper and gingerly lifted the rabbit's tail and held it out at arm's lift. Bigger, tail out! Vera begged again. Bigger laughed and approached the bed with the dangling rat, swinging it to and fro like a pendulum, enjoying his sister's fear. Bigger! Vera grasped convulsively. She screamed and swayed and closed her eyes and fell headlong across her mother and rose limply from the bed to the floor. Bigger, for God's sake, the mother sobbed, raising and bending over Vera. Don't do that. Throw that rat out. He laid the rat down and started to dress. Bigger, help me lift Vera to the bed, the mother said. He paused and turned around. What's the matter, he asked, fin finning ignorance. Do, do what I ask you to do, will you, boy? He went to the bed, helped his 
Mother left Vera. Vera's eyes were closed. He turned away and finished dressing. He wrapped the rat in a newspaper and went out of the door and, and down the stairs and put into the garbage can and, and put it into the garbage can at the corner of an alley. When he returned to the room, his mother was still bent over Vera, placing a wet towel over her head. She straightened and faced him, her cheeks and eyes wet with tears and her lips tight with anger. Boy, sometimes I wonder what makes you act like you do. What, what I do now, he demanded belligerently. Sometimes you act the biggest fool I ever saw. What you talking about? You scared your sister with that rat and, and she fainted. Ain't you got no sense at all? Oh, I, I didn't know she was that scary. Buddy, the mother called. Yes, um, take a newspaper and spread it over that spot. Yes, um, Buddy opened the newspaper and covered the smear of blood on the floor where the rat had been crushed. Bigger went to the window and stood out looking abstractedly into the street. His mother glared at, glared at him, glared at his back. Bigger? Sometimes I wonder why I birthed you, she said bitterly. Bigger, bigger looked at her and turned away. Maybe you oughtn't have. Maybe you ought to have left me where I was. You shut your sassy mouth. Oh, for Christ's sakes, Bigger said, lighting a cigarette. Buddy picks them, picked up them skillets and put them in the sink. Mother says, yes, I'm. Bigger walked across the floor and sat on the bed. His mother's eyes followed him. We wouldn't have to live in this garbage dump if he had any manhood in you, she said. Oh, don't start that again. How you feel, Vera, the mop, the mother asked. Vera raised her head and looked about the room as though expecting to see another rat. Oh, mama, you poor thing. I, I couldn't help it. Bigger scared me. Did you hurt yourself? I bumped my head here. Take it easy. You'll be all right. How come Bigger acts that way, Vera acts, crying again? He just crazy, the mother said, just just plain dumb ass, dumb, black, crazy. I'll be late for my sewing class at the YWCA, Vera said. Here, stretch out on the bed. You'll feel better in a little while, the mother said. She left Vera on the bed and turned a pair of cold eyes upon Bigger. Suppose you wake up some morning and find your sister dead. What would you think then, she asked. Suppose those rats cut out cut out uh, those rats cut our veins out at night when we slept. No, nothing like that ever bothers you. All you care about is your own pleasure. Even when the, re even when the relief offers you a job, you, you won't take it till they threaten to cut off your food and starve you. Bigger honest, you the, you the most no countenance man I've ever seen in my life. You done told me that a thousand times, he said. Not looking round. Well, I'm telling you again, and, and and mark my words. Some of these days, you're gonna sit down and cry. Some of these days, you're gonna wish you had made something out yourself instead of just a tramp. But it'll be too late then. Stop prophesizing about me, he said. I prophesize as much as I please, and if you don't like it, you can get out. We can get along without you. We can live in a one room. We can live in one room just like we live in now, even with you gone, she says. Oh, for Christ's sakes, he says, his voice filled with nervous irritation. You'll regret how you're living someday, she went on. And if you don't stop running with that gang of yours and do right, you'll end up where you never thought you would. You, 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 you think, I don't know what you boys is doing, but I do. And the gallows is at the end of the road you traveling. Boy, just remember that. She turned and turned to Buddy. Throw that box outside, Buddy. Yes, um. There was silence. Buddy took the box out. The mother went behind the curtain to the gas stove. Vera sat up in the bed and swung her feet to the floor. Lay back down, Vera, the mother said. I, f I feel all right now, Ma. I got to go to sewing class. Well, if you feel like it, set the table, the mother said, going behind the curtain again. Lord, I get so tired of this. I, I, I don't know what to do. A voice float, floated plaintively from behind the curtain. All I ever do is try to make a home for you children, and you don't care. Oh, Ma, Vera protested. Don't say that. Vera, sometimes I just want to lay down and quit. Ma, please don't say that. 
I can't last many more years living like this. Uh, I, I'll be old. I'll be old enough to work soon, Mom. I reckon I'll be dead. Then I, I reckon God will call me home. Vera went behind the curtain, and bigger heard her trying to comfort her mother. He shut their voices out of his mind. He hated his family because he knew they were suffering and that he was powerless to help them. He knew that the moment he allowed himself to feel its fullness, how they lived, the shame and misery of their lives, he would be swept out of himself with fear and despair. So he held towards them an attitude of armed reserve. He lived with them, but behind a wall, a curtain, and towards himself, he was even more exacting. He knew that the moment he allowed what his life meant to enter fully into his consciousness, he would either kill himself or someone else. So he denied himself and acted tough. He got up and crushed the cigarette upon the windowsill. Vera came into the room and placed the knives and forks upon the table. Get ready to eat you all, the mother's called. He sat at the table. The odor of frying bacon and boiling coffee drifted to him from behind the curtain. His mother's voice floated to him in a song. Life is like a mountain railroad with an engineer that's brave. We must make the run successful from the cradle to the grave. The song irked him and he was glad when she stopped and came into the room with a pot of coffee and a plate of crinkled bacon. Vera brought the bread and they sat down. His mother closed her eyes and lowered her head and mumbled, Lord, we thank thee for the food you done placed before us for the nourishments of our bodies. Amen. She lifted her eyes and without changing her tone of voice said, you're going to have to learn to get up earlier than this bigger to hold a job. He did not answer or look up. You want me to pour you some coffee, Vera asked. Yeah. You're going to take a job, ain't you, bigger? His mother asked. He laid down his fork and stared at her. I told you last night I, I was going to take it. How many times you want you want to ask me? Well, don't bite her head off, Vera said. She only asked you a question. Pass the bread and stop being smart. You know, you, you have to see Mr. Dalton at 5.30, his mother said. You done, said. you done said that 10 times. I don't want you to forget, son, and, and you know how you can forget, Vera said. Oh, lay off, Bigger Buddy said. He told you he was going to take the job. Don't tell him nothing, Bigger said. You shut your mouth, Buddy, or, uh, or get up from this table, the mother said. I'm not going to take any stinking sass from you. One fool in the family's enough. Lay off, Ma. Buddy said, "Bigger sitting here like he ain't, he glad he ain't glad to get a job." She said, "What what do you want me to do? Shout, bigger bigger axe?" Oh, bigger his sister said, "I wish you just keep your big mouth out of this." He told his sister, "If if you get that job," his mother said in a low kind of voice, busy slicing a loaf of bread. I can fix a nice place for you, for you, for you children. You could be comfortable and not have to live like pigs. Bigger ain't decent enough to think nothing like that, Vera said. God, I wish you all would, would, would let me eat, Bigger said. His mother stopped as though he was, she had, she had not heard him and he, and he stopped listening. She just talked on. Mama's, Mama's talking to you, Bigger, Vera said. So what? Don't be that way, Bigger. He laid down his fork, and as his strong black fingers gripped the edge of the table, there was silence save for a tinkling of his brother's fork against a plate. He kept staring at his sister till her eyes fell. I wish you'd let me eat, he said again. And as he ate, he felt that they were thinking of the job he was to get that evening, and it made him angry. He felt that they had tricked him into cheap surrender. I need some car fare, he said. Here's all I got, his mother said, pushing a quarter to the side of the plate. He put the quarter in his pocket, drained his cup of coffee and one long swallow, put on his coat and cap, and went out the door. You know, bigger, his mother said, if you don't take that job, the relief will cut us off and we won't have any food. I told you I'd take it, he shouted, and he slammed the door. He went down the steps into the vestibule and stood looking out into the streets through the plate glass of the front door. 
Now and then a streetcar rattled past over steel tracks. He was sick of his life at home. Day in and day out, there was nothing but shouts and bickering. But what, what could he do? Each time he asked himself that question, his mind hit a blank wall and he stopped thinking. Across the street directly in front of him, he saw a truck pull to a stop at a curb and two white men in overalls get out with pails and brushes. Yes, he could take the job at Dalton's and be miserable, or he could refuse and starve. It maddened him to think that he did not have a wider choice of action. Well, he could not stand here all day like that. What was he to do with himself? He tried to decide if he wanted to buy a 10 cent magazine or go to the movies or go to the pool room and talk with the gang or just loaf around with his hands deep in his pockets and another cigarette slanting across his chin. He brooded and watched the men at work across the street. They were pasting a huge colored poster to a signboard. The poster showed a white face. That's Buckley, he spoke softly to himself. He's running for state's attorney again. The men were slapping the poster with wet brushes. He looked at the round floor and face and wagged his head. I bet those son of a bitches rake off a million dollars in graft a year. Boy, if I was in their shoes for just one day, I'd never have to worry again. When the men were through, they gathered up their pail and brushes and got into the truck and drove off. He looked at the poster. The white face was fleshy but stern. One hand was uplifted with its index finger pointing straight out into the street at each path of buyer. The poster showed one of those faces that looked straight at you when you looked at it, looked at it and all the while you were walking and turning your head to look at it. It look at it, it kept looking unblinkingly black back at you until you got so far from it you had to take your eyes away and then it stopped like a movie blackout above the top of the poster with the tall red letters, you can't win. He snuffed his cigarette and laughed violently. You crook, he mumbled, shaking his head. Who let, who, you let whoever pays you off win. He opened the door and met the old morning air. He went along the sidewalk with his head down, fingering the quarter in his pocket. He stopped and searched all of his pockets. His vest pocket, he found the loan copper cent. That made him a total of 26 cents, 14 cents of which he would need for car fare to Mr. Dalton's. That is, if he decided to take the job in order to buy a magazine or and go to the movies, he would have to at least have 20 cents more. God damn it, I'm always broke, he mumbled. He stood in the corner in the sunshine watching cars and people pass. He needed more money. If he did not get more than he had now, he would not know what to do with himself the rest of the day. He wanted to see a movie. His senses hungered for it. In a movie, you could dream without effort. All you had to do was lean back in the seat and keep his eyes open. He thought of Gus and G.H. and Jack. Should he go to the pool room and talk with them? But there was no use in going unless they were ready to do what they had been long planning to do. And if they could, it would mean mean some sure and quick money. From 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock in the afternoon, there were no policemen on duty. In the, in the block where Blum's delicatessen was, and it would be safe. One of them could hold a gun on Blum and keep him from yelling. One could watch the front door, and one could watch the back, and one could take the money from the box under the counter. Then all four of them could lock Bloom in the store and run out through the back and duck down the alley and meet an hour later either at Doc's pool room or the South Side Boys Club and split the money. Holding up Bloom might not take more than two minutes at the most, and it would be his last job. There would be tougher ones that they had, that they had ever, it would be one of the tougher ones they had ever pulled. All the other times they raided newsstands, fruit stands, and apartments. And two, they never held up a white man before. They'd always robbed Negroes. They felt that it was much easier and safer to rob their own people, for they knew the white policemen would, would never really search diligently for Negroes 
who committed crimes against other Negroes. For months they talked about robbing the blooms, but they had not been able to bring themselves to do it. They had a feeling that robbing, the robbing of the bloom would be a violation of the ultimate taboo. It would be trespassing into a territory where the full wrath of an alien white world would be turned loose upon them. In short, it would be a symbolic challenge of the white world's rule over them, a challenge which they yearn to make but were afraid to. Yes, if they could rob blooms, it would be a real holdup and in more senses than one. <clears throat> in comparison to the other jobs, it would they would have been play. Goodbye, bigger. He looked up and saw Vera passing with a sewing kit dangling from her arm. She paused at the corner and came back to him. Now what do you want? Bigger, please. You're getting a good job now. Why don't you stay away from Jack, Gus, and G.H. and keep out of trouble? You keep your big mouth out of my business. But Bigger, go on to school, will you? She turned abruptly and walked on. He knew that his mother had been talking to Vera and Buddy about him, telling him that if he got into any more trouble, he would be sent to prison and not just to reform school where they sent him the last time. He did not mind what his mother said to Buddy about him. Buddy was all right, tough plenty, but Vera was a sappy girl. She did not have any more sense than to believe everything she was told. He walked towards the pool room. When he got to the door, he saw Gus a half block away coming towards him. He stopped and waited. It was Gus who first thought of Robin Blooms. Hey, Bigger, what you say, Gus? Nothing. Seen G.H. or Jack yet? No, are you? No, got a cigarette? Yeah. Bigger took out his pack and gave Gus a cigarette. He lit his and held the match for Gus. They leaned their backs against the red brick wall. Brick, uh, red brick wall of the building smoking their cigarettes slanting white across their black chins. To the east, Bigger saw the sun burning a, a dazzling yellow. In the sky above him, a few, white, a few big white clouds drifted. He puffed silently, relaxed, his mind pleasantly vacant of purpose. Every slight movement in the street evoked a casual curiosity in him. Automatically, his eyes followed each car as it whirled over the smooth black asphalt. A woman came by, and he watched the gentle sway of her body until she disappeared into a doorway. He sighed, scratched his chin, and mumbled. Kind of warm today, yeah, Gus said. You get more heat from this sun than from them old radiators at home. Yeah, them old white landlords don't give, don't give much heat. And they always knocking at your door for money. I'm glad when the summer comes. Me too, Bigger said. He stretched his arms above his head and yawned. His eyes moistened. The, sh the sharp precision of the world of steel and stone devolved, dissolved into blurred waves. He blinked and the world grew hard again. Mechanical, distinct. A weaving motion in the sky made his eyes turn upward. He saw a slender streak of billowing white blooming against a dark, against the deep blue. A plane was riding high, was riding high in the air. Look, Bigger said, what? That plane's riding up there, Bigger said, pointing. Oh, they squinted at the, at the tiny ribbon of unfolding vapor that spelled out the words, use. The plane was so far away that at the time the strong glare of the sun blanked it, up, blanked it from sight. You can hardly see it. Looks like a little bird. Bigger breathed with childlike wonder. Them white boys sure can fly, Gus said. Yeah, Bigger said wistfully. They get a chance to do everything. Noiselessly, the, the plane, the tiny plane whooped and veered. Vanishing, appearing, leaving behind it a small shell of white plumage, like coils of fluffy paint, paste being squeezed from a tube. A, a plum coral that grew and swelled and slowly began to fade into the air at edges. The plane wrote another word, sp speed. How high you reckon he is, Big Axe? I don't know, maybe a hundred miles, maybe a thousand. 
I could fly one of them things if I had a chance, Bigger mumbled reflectively as though he was talking to himself. Gus Count pulled, the, pulled down the corners of his lips, stepped from the wall, squared his shoulders, doffed his cap, bowed low and spoke with Mac deference. Yes, sir. You, you go to hell, Bigger said, smiling. Yes, sir, Gus said again. I could fly a plane if I had the chance, Bigger said. If you wasn't black and if you had some money and if they let you go to that aviation school, you could fly a plane, Gus said. And for a moment, Bigger complicated all the it's that Gus had mentioned. Then both boys broke into hard laughter, looking at each other through squinted eyes. When the laughter subsided, Bigger said in a voice that was half question, half statement, it's funny how white white folks treat us, ain't it? It better be funny, Gus said. Maybe they right and not wanting us to fly, Bigger said, because if I took a plane up there, I'd take a couple bombs along and drive them as sure as hell. They laughed again, still looking upward. The plane sailed and dipped and spread another word across the sky. Gasoline. Use speed gasoline. Big amuse, rolling the words slowly from his lips. God, I like to fly up there in that sky. God will let you fly when he gives you your wings in heaven, Gus said. They laughed again, reclining against the wall, smoking the lids of their eyes drooped softly against the sun. Cars whizzed past on rubber tires. Bigger's face was metallically black and in strong sunlight. There was in his eyes a pensive, brooding amusement as of a man who had been long confused, confronted and tantalized by a riddle whose answer seemed always on the verge of escaping him, but prodding him in irresistibly uh, on to seek its solution. The silence irked Bigger. He was anxious to do something to evade looking so squarely at his problem, at this problem. Let's play white, Bigger said, referring to a game of playing acting in which he and his friends imitated the ways and manners of white folks. I don't feel like it, Gus said. General, Bigger pronounced in a sonorous turn, looking at Gus expectantly. Oh, hell, I don't want to play, Gus whined. You'll be court-martialed, Bigger said, snapping out his words with military position. Nigga, you nuts, Gus laughed. General, Bigger tried again determinedly. determinedly. Gus looked wearily at Bigger, then straightened and saluted and answered, Yes, sir. Send your men over the river at dawn and attack the enemy's left flank, Bigger ordered. Yes, sir. Send the 5th, 6th, and 7th Regiment, Bigger said, frowning and attack with tanks, gas, planes, and infantry. Yes, sir, Gus said again, saluting and clicking his heels. For a moment, they were silent, facing each other, their shoulders thrown back, their lips com compressed to hold down the mounting impulse to laugh. Then they golfed, partly at themselves and partly at the vast white world that sprawled and towered in the sun before them. Say, what's a left flank, Gus asked. I don't know, Bigger said. I heard it in the movies. They laughed again. Then after a bit, they, they relaxed and leaned against the wall, smoking. Bigger saw Gus cup his left ear to his left hand to his ear as though holding a telephone receiver. A cup to his right hand to his mouth as though talking into a transmitter. transmitter. Hello, Gus said. Hello, Bigger said. Who's this? This is J.P. Morgan speaking, Gus said. Yes, sir, Mr. Morgan, Bigger said, as I feel with my adulation and respect. I want to sell you, I want to sell 20 shares of U.S. Steel in the market this morning, Gus said. At what price? Uh, just dump them at any price, Gus said, with casual irritation. We're holding too much. Yes, sir, Bigger said, and call me at the club at 2 this afternoon and tell me if the president telephoned, Gus said. Yes, sir, Mr. Morgan Bigger said. Both of them made gestures signifying that they were hanging up telephone receivers. Then they bent, bent double, laughing. I bet, just, I bet that's just the way they talk, Gus said. I wouldn't be surprised, Bigger said. They were silent again. Presently, 
Bigger cupped his hand to his mouth and spoke through an imaginary telephone transmitter. Hello? Hello? Gus says, who's this? This is the President of the United States speaking, Bigger said. Oh, yes, sir, Mr. President, Gus said. I'm calling a cabinet meeting this afternoon at 4 o'clock, and you as Secretary of State must be there. Well, now, Mr. President, uh, Gus said, I'm pretty busy. I'm traveling. Uh, I'm raising sand over there in Germany, and I, and I got to send him a note. But this is important, Bigger said. What are you going to take up at this cabinet meeting, Gus asked. Well, you see, the niggas is raising sand all over the country, Bigger said, struggling to keep his keep back his laughter. And we got to do something with these black folk. And that's the end of the excerpt for uh, today. And I will be picking up another one tomorrow on Richard Wright.